Hi, my name is Tobias Knopf from Hamburg in Germany and today um, I would like to introduce a high performance implementation of the non-equidistant fast Fourier transform. Let's get started. We all know the discrete Fourier transform which is given by this formula and the discrete Fourier transform allows us to take some signal fj and um, expre uh, express is it as a superposition of complex sine waves where fk here are the Fourier coefficients. They are simply weightings of these complex uh, sine waves. I use here um, a somewhat uncommon definition because it is um, compatible with the uh, later NDFT. This will become clear later. What's important is that the DFT um, has a um, computation cost uh, which is quadratic in the length of these uh, two vectors n and this quadratic cost is often much uh, too large to make the DFT applicable. And fortunately in the last century the fast free transform has been developed short FFT and it allows to reduce the computational cost from a quadratic cost to an n log n cost and the FFT is one of the most important algorithm of the 20th century. It is, for instance, in the top 10 of the IEEE magazine, Computing in Science and Engineering. And it really um, allowed the signal processing community to um, evolve uh, much uh, rapid, more rapidly um, because we were able to switch between time and frequency space so easy. And it also runs on low cost hardware and therefore the FT is really one of the most important algorithms. However, there's one strict restriction and the restriction is that the FT is restricted to equidistant sampling nodes. So these K, J here are equidistant. Both signals are sampled in an equidistant fashion. And the question is whether this is actually a problem and the answer is in most cases not. But there are applications where we really sample um, on non-equidistant sampling nodes and I would have here an example which is magnetic resonance imaging where you can see in the background the k-space. Um, and in MRI we often sample along such tr uh, spiral trajectories and in these cases we require and DFT on non-equidistant sampling nodes. Another example is OCT. In OCT, uh, we have um, we are also sampling in the frequency domain um, and have um, sampling on an equidistant wavelength, but the optical frequency is one by the wavelengths, and then again we are have non-equidistant sampling uh, nodes. And these two examples motivate the introduction of what we call the non-equidistant discrete uh, Fourier transform, which um, yeah, is usually defined in this way, that you have on the left hand side um, your time signal or space signal, and on the right uh, hand side your Fourier coefficients here. And the important thing here now is that this xj here is uh, can be non-equidistant sampling nodes within the interval minus a half and a half, while the k um, is still equidistant. And we use a multi-dimensional formulation here where n is the length d vector and uh, the components run from minus n half to n half where, where basically uh, the, uh, n is the, the number of Fourier coefficients. The algorithmic complexity of the NF NDFT if you implement it in a naive fashion is m times the absolute of i n which is basically quadratic cost. And because this is too much in many applications the Non-equidistant fast Fourier transform, short NFT, has been developed in the 90s um, of the last century. It is an approximative algorithm and it allows to execute the NFT in just n log n plus um, an additional m factor. It um, has been, as I said, developed in the 90s and is used uh, in MRI and OCT. Just for example, there are further applications of the NFT. And the key idea is to introduce a convolution with a kernel phi. And this 
allows us then basically to grid the data from non-equidistant to equidistant or vice versa. And this in the end enables FFT usage. I will come to this um, in these slides. You can see on the left hand side an equidistantly sampled um, frequency space signal. And on the right hand side you can see that we here have non-equidistant sampling points. And the question is how can we go from here to there. And the answer is what we first do is we simply apply an FFT to the left hand side and then we end up at these red dots. And now the question is how can we go from the data sample at the red dots to the purple dots. And to do so we do, um, do a trick and we introduce a convolution with a small kernel um, with a, f a function phi. And <clears throat> this kernel simply allows us then to, to switch from equidistant to non-equidistant sampling nodes. However, because this convolution is kind of introduced, um, yeah, um, introduced in the formula, we need to somehow correct it. And this can actually be done uh, in the first place because this convolution corresponds um, to a multiplication frequency space. And if we deconvolve, which means dividing by phi hat, we have corrected that operation. Another important trick of the NFFT is that we truncate the window function phi leading to a window function psi. And this is essential to make the operation fast because the convolution really needs to be fast and therefore uses truncated windows. And here you see the mathematics behind the NFFT. So we start with a deconvolution where you can see we divide by phi hat. Then we apply an ordinary FFT, which is fast. And finally, we apply the convolution. And um, some details now. First of all, the um, uh, variable small n here is simply uh, sigma times large n, where sigma is what we call an oversampling factor, which basically is, just means that we need to do the FFT on a, a little bit finer grid. Um, m is the window size. Um, which is kind of the um, leads to the truncation. And this allows us to not loop over the enter index that's i n, which is very large, but just loop over a very small portion. And this means this sum here is basically uh, just something like 10 summons or so. And it is in particular constant and does not depend on n. What's important is that the NFT um, can uh, leads uh, to um, certain accuracy and this accuracy can be controlled. Um, and we can mathematically prove that for certain window functions and sigma 2 m equal to 8, we reach machine precision, which means although we have an approximative algorithm, we can use it like an exact one in, because of this insight. As I said, the complexity is done uh, n log n plus m. And we now want to look at potential de design space. So if you want to take this algorithm, so the question is, what could be potential goals of an NFT implementation? And the first is, it should of course be generic in the data type. It should be dimension agnostic. It should allow changing the window function. It should um, have different pre-computation strategies, which allow speeding up um, the entire computation. It should be as fast as possible, which includes a um, multi-threaded implementation. Um, of course, we want our code to be readable and maintainable. And finally, often one also wants the um, library to be reusable and binding friendly. And the issue now is that all this, if you combine this, leads to certain trade-offs that need to be made. For instance, um, writing something in the dimension agnostic fashion often makes the code less readable and less maintainable. Some famous implementations um, which exist are the NFT3 library, which is a C library, which allows to um, apply the NFT to, an, uh, to arbitrary dimension data. Then quite recently, uh, the library Finu FFT has been introduced, which is written in C, C++. It has one to, two, uh, one to 3D transform and is nowadays one of the fastest CPU libraries so far. And there are also GPU libraries, which I will not go into detail um, in this talk today. So this brings us then 
to the um, library, uh, the package nft.jl, which I introduced today. And nft.jl uh, NFT has been developed since 2013. And it actually started as a toy project because I wanted to evaluate whether Julia is capable of implementing a performance critical uh, algorithm. And it turned out that this toy or experiment was very successful. Nowadays, um, NFT.j is not, not a toy anymore, but it is the backbone of our MRI research at our institute, but also other MRI research are using what we the, the package MRIRECO.jl. Um, and in early 2020, the uh, development was accelerated because we wanted to uh, implement multi-threading, which, which required some architectural changes. So nowadays, the goals are we want to be as fast as comparable uh, CC++ libraries. We want no code duplication, but clean, generic, and dimension agnostic code. Um, as a side goal, we wanted to stress test Julia's multi-threading capabilities. And finally, in 2020, um, I decided to actually go for an abstract NFT dot, uh, NFT uh, .jl interface package, which allows not just to implement, uh, implement our pure Julia code, but also have wrapper libraries. So NFT3 and FinoFT have, have wrapper libraries, and these can coexist here uh, as well. So <clears throat> let's start with a simple example. This is uh, NFT.jl usage in, in action. We start by um, defining our sampling nodes. With that, we can create what we call a plan, which defines the transformation. Then we have some input vector. And finally, we can apply the NFT by just uh, using the multiplication and, and multiply the plan with our input vector. Uh, the same goes for the adjoint trans, uh, transform. And uh, I want to note that this year, is the common interface for an operator in Julia. So here you, we have not invented any new functions, but we just use the existing common notation in Julia. Of course, um, these uh, multiplication um, have uh, need to allocate the output vector, and therefore we also provide low-level interface, which use the Malbang um, interface, which is also common in Julia. And we also have a high-level interface where you don't require an explicit uh, plan, which is also a common thing. So let's now go into a little bit to uh, more detail. So how did uh, we do this dimension agnostic implementation? What we needed to do is we needed to implement um, custom Cartesian iterators. And I want to shortly talk about how you do this in C. In C, you have two options. The fir first is that you implement uh, an implementation uh, a code in 1D, then in 2D, and in 3D, and you um, combine all this. Um, and this is the fastest that you can do, but it leads to redundant code. The alternative is what is called a dynamic Cartesian iterator, but unfortunately this is slow and um, yeah, it, it, it leads to no code redundancies, uh, but because it is slow, it is not suitable in this case. And I want to give you one example um, from within Fino FFT. NFT3 is the same. There we, at some point, we have the switch statement where we can see that at, at that point, you then um, yeah call different implementations, one from 1D, for 2D, for 3D, and so on. And um, yeah, in this case, we don't have a fallback which is then simply, uh, yeah, not possible. So how does the situation look in Julia? And unfortunately, we have better options. And the first option is called base.cartesian. And base.cartesian easily allows us to loop um, over in, in array A here and use that. And the important point is now that I here is not a scalar anymore, but it is a multi-index. The alternative is to use what is called base Cartesian. It is a macro-based solution which takes um, yeah, this, these macros here and then for uh, d equal to 3, translate that to this uh, nested for loops. And um, we in nft.jl use both um, solutions, but in most cases we stick with base Cartesian. And the reason is that we our inner for loop 
always looks a little bit different than the other ones and um, furthermore we wanted to um, multi-thread only the outer for loop and this was easier with base.cartesian. So <clears throat> now let's jump into um, the implementation. The implementation starts with the deconvolution which is a simple scale operation and we include the FFT shift, take this into account in our implementation and the multi-threading here is very simple. So just multi-thread this for loop and you are basically done. Then we needed to implement the FFT and there of course we um, use the package FFTW and the nice thing is that FFTW um, has support for the Julia thread pool and this can be reused. Then finally uh, we come to the convolution, the last step, and it needs to be said that this is the main bottleneck of the NFFT and this can also be sh seen in this profile um, where you can see this here is um, the, um, this is the uh, convolution operation, so this is an adjoint profile of an adjoint transform. Here we have the fraction of the FFT, very short, and finally we have this deconvolution, which is actually hard to see in this profile. And this motivates in the following, we just look at the convolution because this is the main bottleneck. So here it is, this is a convolution. And um, yeah, the first trick that one needs to do really is this Psi uh, function, this truncated window function, need, is very expensive to uh, evaluate and therefore we need to pre-compute cache it. I will not go into details uh, within this talk, but this is very essential for an FFT implementation. The next thing um, is that if you look at these XJs, these XJs, um, if you jump from j to j plus 1, it may happen that the nodes are at very different positions and this then may lead to cache misses and this will um, um, yeah, um, drastically worsen performance and therefore we need to do something about that. And the trick that has actually been uh, proposed by FinoFFT is uh, to use a uh, block partitioning um, um, algorithm. You have the similar strategy also if you uh, look at BLAST routines, they also use blocking. And uh, what we basically do is we take our enter sampling, um, sampling area and then we introduce these green boxes here and then group certain nodes together and then perform the summation only over these small. So the purple area here is this uh, summation here. And then we simply do this uh, for different uh, nodes and group them together. And this allows us um, to has le have less cache misses. So let's just roughly look at real code. So if you look at the convolution, so this operation here, the inner one, this is how it looks in nft.jl. You can see that we here have these nested um, um, sums, which are basically um, this uh, Cartesian uh, for loops. I know it's it's uh, you need to be familiar with with the syntax, but if you can read it, it's it's not that bad. Then we pre-calculate um, here those um, those window function, which is done in 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 this line. And then during the summation, we need to um, yeah, calculate the tensor product. And this can be done in a nested fashion. Furthermore, we need to um, calculate this offset here. So the index of G, where you have a certain offset. And this is done here in, in, this, in this line. And what's important here is that because we have a sm so small summation, we can um, use fixed size arrays and we here in this implementation use tuples for that. And this is really essential because it allows the comp compiler to take the inner loop and unroll it or apply SEMD operations. And this is really important. So let's shortly also review the adjoint convolution. 
And the advert join convolution is a little bit more complicated because if you look at this sum, you can um, see that we have a different index set here. And the issue is if you have node that are clustered, then this sum can be very large. And if you have um, areas where no nodes uh, are within it, the, um, the, the sum has actually no summons. And this means in this formulation, we would have a very dynamic sum and this would lead to a drastic performance uh, issues if, it, uh, if we need to loop over this uh, index set here. So calculating this index set is not efficient. And what people actually do is they do it in a different fashion. They instead, they, they basically um, switch the order of the for loops and loop first uh, in the outer loop over J here, and then in the inner loop, a uh, loop over um, the actual index set. And this requires us to um, yeah, have such an update mechanism where we, where we initialize GL here with zeros and then update it all the time. And this is very nice because we can use the, the original implementation that I've shown you before for the direct transform um, with all these um, fixed size arrays. The problem, however, is that we now here have a data dependency and this means that multi-threading gets complicated. And the solution here is, of course, to use again block partitioning, which then solves this issue. And I show you this um, just roughly here. This is uh, what we actually implement. And there you can see again, here we have this, this inner convolution and we do this um, for each block. So here you can see that we have here par four. This is a parallel for loop and we do this for each block. However, at some point we have um, processed a block and then we need to update it to the vector G and this is done here and we need to lock this critical section. Um, but fortunately, this uh, lock is not problematic because the fraction of, of this operation here is very small. And I want to show you this in this um, uh, profile where you again can see this is uh, the hard workload of the convolution and here we have uh, the, the critical section. So we, we don't have an issue here with performance. And we did some performance and accuracy evaluations. We um, applied 1D to 3D transforms. We um, take random input nodes, um, use common um, settings for the accuracy. Um, we use the Kaiser Bessel window. We use one to eight threads, um, use an AMD uh, CPU with 64 cores, and we compare the NFT.jl to NFT3 and FinUFT. And as an accuracy measure, we use a relative error. And uh, benchmarks are done with benchmark tools. And here you can see the results for the 1D transform. And I first need to explain this graph. So first of all, in the x-axis, we have, um, we, you see the relative error. So we, we ran the algorithm with different accuracy settings, and then you reach this certain relative error. And on the y-axis, you can see the runtime. So how fast were you? And um, kind of the lower the runtime um, for, for each accuracy, the better. And you can see in 1D, NFT.jl is really now the fastest library compared to its competitors. And this holds true both for the direct transform as well for the adjoint transform. This also is valid in 2D. In 3D, you can see that FinUFFT and NFT.jl are reach a similar performance, uh, both in the direct and in the adjoint transformation. Um, the NFT.jl is uh, sometimes a little bit uh, faster. And in, in this case, we have an interesting uh, case where NFT.jl um, is slower. Um, and um, it's still not clear for me um, the reason if why the compiler is not able to emit efficient code for this uh, case, which might have uh, something to do with the tuple length. 
What's also important, which I have not shown here, is the pre-computation time. There I have to say that FinUFT is still the fastest library. We NFT.j is a little bit slower, but um, th this is not, not, uh, not much. It's just a little bit slower. So finally, we come to the multi-threading results. And uh, here we have shown the speed up um, compared to uh, FinUFFT. And there you can see that all uh, show, show a, a nice speed up if we uh, increase the number of threads, both in the direct and in the adjoint uh, transform, where, as I said before, the adjoint is actually quite challenging to multi-thread. And also, if you look at the parallel efficiency, you can see that all algorithms reach a similar performance of um, something like a half for eight thread, which is actually quite good for such an operation. And with that, I would like to summarize. So Julia is very suitable for implementing such a performance critical um, um, uh, algorithm like the NFT. I want to stress that we needed to make less trade-offs. So it was very simple to have a dimension agnostic implementation. And if you compare the code size of NFT.jl, it actually is a factor of two to three smaller than NFT3 and FinUFT, which is also because of this uh, code duplication that we don't require. Some challenges. So threading, um, has a challenge that we are not able to choose the runtime um, uh, uh, during runtime the number of threads. And this is actually an issue because um, for small transform in, in 1D, we actually as a package would like to um, disable threads or use a less a smaller number of, uh, of threads than the user specified as a global, global um, variable. And this is something where we really have an issue in Julia right now. Another challenge is, or the question is, what to use? Should I use polyester.jl, floops? We currently use floops.jl or base threads. What to choose? This is something where I think, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we need to uh, do, uh, arrive at a single solution at some point. And I also want to give an outlook. So what is uh, still missing are the real variants of the and FFT, which is the called so-called NFCT and NFST, so cosine and sine transform. What we also would like to implement is the NNFFT, which is a transformation that is non-equidistant in both uh, domains. And we have a prototype of a pure Julia GPU implementation, um, but it, this prototype is not um, ideal um, at this point. And if anybody is interested um, to work on this, we are open for collaboration. And with that, I want to thank you for your, your attention. Bye bye.